So I wanted just to give you, I mean, this whole, this whole introductory session is about uh, giving you a little bit of introduction to each of the instructors and our, our general ideas about, about conservation, where we're coming from. Um, so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about some work that I did in Mexico, in southern Mexico in the, in the early 1990s. Um, the country of Mexico, this state here in the south is Oaxaca, and this red area in northern Oaxaca is the, is the reserve we're talking about. It's an arid lands reserve. This is what it looks like. So these are columnar cacti, uh, essentially tree-sized cactus. Um, the landscape is fabulous. It's a really, really neat area. Um, you don't say anything, but can anybody identify anybody in this picture? No, not you either. Anybody recognize any? Yeah, that's me. Uh, I started dyeing my hair gray just to look not so, not so young. Um, anyhow, this is a team that was along on my doctoral dissertation work in the late 80s. And this team kind of evolved into a team that worked across the state of Oaxaca in the early 90s. So you can see all of these points are places in Oaxaca where we had a team go in for between two weeks and two months. Um, some of these sites like this and these are in tropical rainforest. Some are in tropical dry forest, like here on the Pacific coast. And then a lot were in montane areas, especially in the intermontane valley. So you can kind of understand the geography of Mexico with an eastern mountain range. Here's the, the Gulf Coast up here. So there's an eastern mountain range like this. Here's the Pacific coast. And there's a western mountain range like this. And then there are these fairly dry valleys in between. Um, and we were focused mainly on montane areas, um, especially in cloud forest regions. Um, but we did some other surveys. And this was actually one of those other surveys. Um, but that just gives you an idea of what we were able to do in about, about four full years of work. Um, and it eventually, it was, it was part of the formulation of this biosphere reserve. Um, it was well known that this area was a, or is a center of endemism for plants. Um, and they needed vertebrate information. And so our team was contracted to, um, to do the vertebrate surveys. And so we put in groups to so here's the actual reserve, and we did this entire fringe. These parts are, are quite arid. Um, the bird faunas were better known, but this part of this possible reserve hadn't really been surveyed. This is just, just a map of elevation. So in brown, you see lowlands, and in green, you see highlands. If I put it in, uh, this is just imagery from Google Earth, you can see the same lowlands and interior, here are the mountains. And what you can see is montane forest. So this is the cloud forest in darkest green. And then this all used to be rainforest. It's very highly degraded now. Um, but there was a very interesting corridor of essentially gallery forest, which was in terms of bird faunas uh, and plants, it was lowland rainforest coming up along this river and into the interior. So it was a very interesting intrusion of lowlands into dry interior highlands. Um, and indeed, as of 1998, this, this reserve was set up. Um, and again, you can, you can just get a, a feel for, we didn't do anything comprehensive but we did fill in a major gap because that, that upland eastern side hadn't been looked at in great care. And now this reserve, well, it's number one of, of four things to do in Tehuacan, which probably tells you something about Tehuacan. It's not exactly an exciting city, but this is a pretty neat place. Um, you can see some very scenic areas. 
Um, and in terms of plants, I didn't have time to dig out detailed views, but there are, uh, for example, cycad species that are endemic to single valleys in this region. Um, so in terms of birds and indeed in terms of vertebrates in general, there's this almost no endemism. And this is, this is relevant to what I'll be talking about in a couple of days, but the plant endemism was really quite extreme. Um, but a really interesting phenomenon, and again, this is, this is a lighter example than the preceding ones. Um, a, an interesting phenomenon is that with this biosphere reserve designation, a lot of research began. And so you start seeing researchers come in and focus on the plants and the vertebrates of this region. So hummingbirds and the plants they visit in the Tehuacan Cuicatlan Biosphere Reserve in Mexico, uh, towards the identification of a core zone in the Tehuacan Cuicatlan Biosphere Reserve based on parsimony analysis of endemicity, not my favorite technique, of flowering plant species, but they, they identify some core zones that, that really represent the gold in this, in this biosphere reserve in terms of uh, the plant endemism. Um, some review papers, biological diversity in the valley, uh, protected areas and climate change, a case study of the cacti in this biosphere reserve. So you really start getting a, an interesting literature emerging that focuses on this region, and it's all since the decree of the biosphere reserve. Um, so I think now the case for the value in terms of biodiversity of this region, I think the case is pretty clear. Um, you can also see the value of it in terms of scenic um, uh, beauty. It's, a, it's an amazing place. Um, and again, that's intended just as kind of a lighter introduction um, to, to the sorts of things that I do. More at the planning stage, more at the uh, characterization stage, and not at all involved in, in these really difficult and complex questions of, of implementation. Any questions? That was much more substance free. <coughs> yeah, Emily, hold on one second. Okay. okay thank you very much for this talk. <coughs> I'm sure this is easy, but I'm a bit uh, confused. Who, at what point you assign biosphere reserve status and protected area reserve? status to uh, an area. Ah, okay, so um, my understanding of this process, and maybe Lee knows more about this or somebody else does, um, but my understanding of this process is that uh, the biosphere reserve status depends on a formal proposal. And so a proposal is made that, that assembles all of the value and status and potential of an area. Um, and I, what, it's to UNESCO, Lee? You know? Um, I knew it just one second ago. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, I, I believe it is to UNESCO. And so essentially, um, UNESCO has certain qualities that they're looking for to be able to confer this status. And you know, the interesting thing about biosphere reserve status is that it does not ex exclude human presence. In fact, a few years ago, a proposal was put in to declare the city of Chicago as a biosphere reserve. I don't think it was approved, and I personally don't think it should have been approved. <laughs> um, but the, the point is that this is intended as a natural and human landscape. Of course, with the proposal goes, essentially, how is this interface between natural and and human landscapes going to be controlled, overseen, uh, managed? Uh, how is it going to evolve into the future? Now, protected area status, which might be you know, perhaps national park status, that's a national thing. And so the dynamic will differ in every single situation. Okay? okay. Okay, one more question. That is, uh, uh, I think that 
the animal habitat preference uh, is related to their habitat and uh, what I have that uh, in the biosphere uh, there is uh, a lot of plant endemism but uh, low low endemism in avian yes uh, what will be the reason that because of uh, most of the time uh, animals prefer their specific uh, uh, habitat and if there are a lot of uh, plant species what would be the reason that uh, low mm -hmm. amount of so species? why the difference between animals and plants um, I don't have a good answer for that but certainly in Mexico you have a very uh, endemism rich arid lands fauna and uh, sorry flora and with the f faunas the endemism tends to be not in the arid lands and so it's probably referring it's probably a consequence of time scales at which the plant endemics were generated versus the animal endemics and opportunities for isolation um, I don't really have a visual to show you this, but in Mexico you have desert systems that are very broad in the north, and as you come into central Mexico they constrict. There's a very tiny neck right near Mexico City that connects the northern deserts and these, these southern deserts, but there was a lot of opportunity for isolation in the southern it's deserts, but it's not deserts like in the Arabian Peninsula. It's very highly vegetated desert. Um, and so I think there was a lot of opportunity for plants to be isolated in this region and generating um, this endemism. Why the contrast between animals and plants? It, I'm guessing, has something to do with the time scale of speciation in the plants versus the animals. But no good, no good answer for you there.